<laughs> All right, this is better. <laughs> I'm Donnie, and I work in tech support <laughs> for Caesars. <laughs> We're not in Caesars, though. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> That's why you broke the mic. <laughs> um, I'm Dr. Aman Chowdhury. I lead ethics and AI at Accenture. Hello. Um, my name is Ariel Herbert Voss. Um, I'm a PhD student at Harvard and a former black hat hacker and now on a redemption arc. These are getting better as well. Second round is better. Uh, hi. I'm Sam. I'm a reporter at Motherboard, Vice's science technology outlet. And my team and I were the first to discover deepfakes. So my name is Dr. Britt Paris. I'm a researcher at Data and Society Research Institute following rhetoric and technical solutions around deepfakes. Uh, and I've been following this since Sam broke it um, in 2017. So yeah, I think that's enough. Rather than handing it back, let's just start back with you. Um, <laughs> I, the the qu first question I want to start with is, uh, you know, Sam and her team have been across the story for a while, uh, but you know, sort of, it's only been the past six months or so that you know, uh, organizations like CNN and uh, I think lawmakers are really talking about this. Uh, but do you think it's being blown out of proportion? Is it our deep fakes? the national security and the risk to the 2020 election, like some people are saying? Well, here's what I think. Um, and it may not be a popular opinion, but I will commend Sam's reporting when she broke um, the phenomenon back in 2017 and sort of more clearly laying out the harms and the harms to whom uh, that we should actually be worried about. And I think a lot of the discourse around deep fakes at present, the policy that's being introduced around it, the ways in which, um, you know, sort of larger major media news outlets are glomming on to a lot of this panic and focusing on, you know, the threat to elections, the threat to politics with a capital P, uh, really disregards, and I think um, problematically disregards the harms to, uh, you know, already vulnerable populations like women who are targeted um, disproportionately by fake imagery, you know, even going back to the beginning of the internet, uh, people were developing, you know, sort of Photoshop fakes and things like that of women, and it hasn't stopped, and indeed this is just sort of an expansion of that um, trajectory. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that was really well said. I'm glad we're jumping right into this. I was thinking we were going to ease into, like, is it all, is deep fakes fake? Um, but here we are. So, yeah, um, yeah, as Britt mentioned, um, this technology was first and foremost developed by men to harass or use women's images without their consent. That's the reality of it. Um, deepfakes, uh, I spoke to him a little bit over Reddit DMs. Um, I, you know, I asked him, uh, what is, uh, why did you do this? What, why did you make this? Um, and his response was, I'm just a programmer. Uh, I'm just honing my craft. Um, I had a hobby. I like porn. I like developing algorithms so I put them together and that's kind of the story going back before deepfakes for years um, so yeah it's um, it's tough because a lot of the reporting does focus on um, politics um, people who are public figures um, being targeted by this but I mean correct me if I'm wrong and if I'm missing something but I haven't really seen any like substantial harm done to anyone in politics or uh, in like a public position that has been a result of, deep, of deepfakes. Um, so yeah, it's tough because that's where the media is kind of focused. And I think because it was December 2017, it was right after you know the elections and right before the midterms, it's, um, it kind of hit a really, um, a really soft spot about fake news and what's gonna happen to truth. Um, and what are we gonna do with, uh, with this new technology that's gonna destroy our image of truth and the fact is that it's still being used to harass women um it's uh there's been a ton of good reporting on that um but yeah i i'm not really sure why other than just uh it's attention grabby to say that it's gonna create a nuclear war or something the end of reality, end of reality. <laughs> um so yeah i don't know that's that's kind of my too long didn't read of what's happened <laughs> i hope you read <laughs> so I think that the concern with date fakes actually um, resides more in how centralized a lot of the media infrastructure is these days. Because when I think back to when I used to run 
uh, troll operations, um, the way that people would communicate was on like forums that weren't Reddit and in various like places on the internet. But these days, most of the comment sections have turned into YouTube, or they turned into Reddit, or they turned into Twitter, um, which means if you want to get content out to a large population, you can do that so much faster than you could like 10 years ago. And to me, I think that that's more of a threat than the deep fakes are, because like as, as my co-panelists have said, um, this technology has been around for a while, and it's, we have seen some harms, but not like anything significant. But um, I think that social media is maybe a bit more harmful, and we should look more at that. I'm going to take a slightly different opinion. So the deepfakes technology has improved quite a bit, actually, and you can train on, on much fewer images. This is where deep nudes came from, right? It just became much easier to do it over time. Um, so by background, I am a social scientist, but a quantitative social scientist, so I work in AI as well. And as, a, as both my political scientist hat on and as my technologist hat on, I can tell you that confirmation bias is real. Deepfakes don't have to actually be good for people to believe them. People want to. People believed Pizzagate. Right? Like, let us not forget Pizzagate. It is very easy to make something reasonable enough that a population will believe it. So when we think about elections, how might this be used? I think actually the way it's being framed is a little bit wrong. It's not that it's going to be used to make a video about somebody to attack that person. What will happen is there will be misinformation, disinformation. Those are two totally different things being spread to particular communities to misinform them or disenfranchise them, very specifically focusing on low-income minority communities to get them to not turn out to vote, to get them to think that the issues aren't relevant to them, that politicians don't care about them, so what's the point of turning up, right? So that's one way it's used. And also, like, and I do agree on the centralized media, and but that is in the West. So when we think about Myanmar and the, and the um, massacre of the Rohingyas that's happening right now, that is that, that can be directly attributed to certain social media outlets. Why? Because in developing nations and in smaller, poorer countries, you know, all due respect to CNN, they're not exactly reporting on the you know election results of Myanmar or what's happening, and et cetera. So the, so the people in these nations turn to Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to get their news. So when we combine deep fakes with you know, the proliferation of bot architecture and the ability to spread misinformation, very, very directly we've seen impact assessments done of you know, how, did, how did Facebook drive misinformation in, in Myanmar. Um, and so when we think about when we think about how elections might be impacted, we're not just talking about the U.S. elections. So in the U.S., it would be something like finding vulnerable populations and disenfranchising them. But in other parts, in other parts of the world, it very, very directly impacts the elections that are happening. Um, so, Sam, maybe this might be uh, best for you, but open to, to all of you. Um, the, you know, I think... As we discuss this in the political context, you know, that is oftentimes where uh, the social media corporations actually react because when, you know, there's a pile on from either media or Congress, you know, that's where we'll see whether it's between disinformation or deep fakes. It's only when it seems to get political and, you know, you get calls from about a Nancy Pelosi video that Zuckerberg and Sandberg and Jack Dorsey and people start really talking about it. Um, but you mentioned the real problem which is actually happening right now of the uh, sort of revenge porn type material. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that of, you know, Kate, you know, victims of that that you've spoken to specifically. Um, and I, I know, you know, the, the impact is the same whether it's deep fake or not. But have you spoken to victims who where it's specifically been a deep fake? Yeah, so um, so something I hear quite a bit um, from people who have good intentions about talking about revenge porn and algorithmic uh, face swapping stuff is, um, well, if, if nothing is real, then everything's real, and everything's real, and nothing's real, and you can just kind of say, oh, that's not me in that video, um, it's not you, like it's not me having sex in that video like blow it off like it's nothing um but that's not really getting to the truth of what it feels like to have one of these made of you um i was talking to danielle citron who um was going to be here but um she she um said it very um succinctly and i think it was a very good way of putting it that um when you see a video like that of yourself um, and it looks like you having sex on camera, which it does look like that, the images are low res and grainy anyway, so it, it's believable. Um, 
But you see that and you think hundreds and thousands of people have seen this. Um, it feels like your body. It doesn't matter that it's not. Um, what people see is you in that video. Um, so, yeah, I think that's um, that's something that a lot of people don't quite understand about deepfakes, um, especially when it comes to when it's used against women. Um, it's definitely the same feeling as having like revenge porn posted of you online. It is re it is revenge porn, but it's just made with an algorithm. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's kind of the heart of it. Is it feels like it's you, even though it's not, and it doesn't matter that it's not. Um, people see that it is you, and that kind of gets to um, the other points that were made. That um, you know, with the Nancy Pelosi video, like that wasn't a deep fake. That was uh, slowed down footage to make her look drunk. It was a video that was posted on Facebook and it got hundreds of thousands of shares. Um, that wasn't a deep fake at all, and it was just bad editing. But people shared it, whether they thought it was funny. They were like, "Oh, haha! I know it's not real, but it's I don't like Nancy Pelosi, so I'm going to share it anyway." Um, or people thought it was real, and they saw it in their feed, and they scrolled by, and they were like, "Oh, crazy! Share." Um, <laughs> It doesn't matter. People don't think before they share a lot of the times. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's one of the key points to, to remember with that. And totally agree. So with the Nancy Pelosi video, another thing to think about is the network effect, right? So it's not just you sharing it. Is what about the second degree person or third degree person that maybe heard or said, you know, heard somebody talk about there's a video of Nancy Pelosi. So it's like a giant game of telephone. I may have seen the video. I'm like, oh, there's this terrible fake video of Nancy Pelosi looking like she's drunk, but she's really not. A next degree person just sort of scrolls through, as you mentioned, and sees Nancy Pelosi's drunk on some video. And even if it gets debunked, even, you know, that second or third degree person, that news may not filter to them. Um, so you're absolutely correct. There's this reputational effect. And when it goes to thinking about deep fakes and nudes for women, it is akin to assault. It is. It is a violation of your body and your being, even if it is not you. And the psychological impact it has on women, it is actually very massive. And I'm curious to see sort of where legislation heads on this, because we've seen New York pass revenge porn laws and deep fakes would be included in that. But I'm curious see like what are the protections that, that are going to exist for, for women or for people it's not just going to be women um, for people that these videos are made about um, how receptive are you okay? Yeah. yeah. how receptive has because um, obviously you know if you post a content like this on Facebook or Twitter it should be taken down because it's porn um, regardless but sometimes that doesn't happen, but how receptive have you know the sort of major um, porn websites like Pornhub and others been to uh, removing this content and um, you know taking it down? And who's best place? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, do you um, want to or no? All I was going to say is it's still there. Yeah, um. it's still deepfakes are still on Pornhub. Um, even though I've been on Pornhub's ass um, about this, they don't care. Um, Pornhub is owned by a giant conglomerate called MindGeek, and they don't give a shit. Twitter and Facebook are better about this, but it's not until a journalist comes knocking that they care at all. If it's just you and you're like, I'm in this video, what do I do? It's not going to get taken down. So I wanted to get at um, the, the, I guess, I think you mentioned how um, deep fakes fits into the wider sort of disinformation shit show uh, that we've sort of has particularly risen over the past three or four years. Um, how <laughs> how does one prepare and, and what should researchers do and what should the media do when, you know, as we talk more about deep fakes um, and particularly in this sort of political context, um, you know, I often think that were something like the Access Hollywood tape to drop um, of Trump in, in 2016, uh, if that were to happen in 2020, you know, he could easily just say, well, that's fake audio. Um, so how 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 deep fakes and the knowledge that this technology exists actually allows us to say well actually what really happened didn't happen um and i think you have some experience of sort of that that wider space um, I'm kind of of two minds of this, because on, on one hand, I, I'd like to say that um, personal responsibility, like you should pay attention to what media you're consuming. Um, but on the other hand, since so many of these media companies, like they're all optimizing for you to pay attention to them, you kind of don't have a choice in a way. So uh, a, a lot of people campaigning for teaching kids and adults uh, how to 
consume better media often fall flat because it's just exhausting to have to audit every single piece of information that you read online. Um, and it's just easier to fall into like, well, my neighbor or my parents who are sharing all this stuff on, on the internet, like they're sharing that. So that's maybe a signal of trust and I can trust that even though like it's actually some sort of fake news sort of situation. Um, I don't really have a solution. Um, <laughs> sorry for a dystopic take. No, and so I'm piggybacking off of Ariel. Again, this sort of goes back to how people form their ideas, their opinions and thoughts. And this is removing it from the technology. Like we cement our opinions and thoughts and ideals about the world from our network and our community and actually from childhood. So a lot of the political science literature um, goes back to about like why do people have the beliefs they hold and what would make them change their mind. And the the negative answer is like it's very very hard to change someone's mind and like when we make fake media people consume it in order to reinforce it's not that they're getting fooled they actually want to consume things that reinforce their beliefs um, so that's so part of the deep fakes is sort of feeding into that very human nature of wanting these things so to your point like trying to teach people like there's an assumption being made if we want to teach people to verify media that they want this media to, that they want to verify it when they actually don't I mean people will follow weird like you know Dr. Mercola you can cure cancer with goji berries websites because they desperately want to believe these things right um, so there, there is something deeper sort of about humanity but then to your question of you know will this then sort of disrupt the ability to even share any information the, like is this are you were jumping into this, in this is this the end of reality question um, there, there is some work going on from a technical perspective to try to understand the provenance of media. So I am Accenture's representative to partnership on AI, which is sort of the big like industry. Everybody gets together and we're trying to kind of solve these things. One of the work streams are having, it's actually going to be an X Prize, um, is about media provenance. So how would you figure out a technical way to prove if something's real or not real? And it's going to actually have quite a lot, if you are familiar with XPRIZE, they actually have quite a lot of money attached to them. So it is actually going to be a challenge put out to the community. I guess sort of to, um, again, piggyback of what my colleagues here on the panel have said, I think it's important to ground rhetoric around deep fakes in these very social and political processes of um, not only technical production, but of belief, of the distribution of harms, and of holding those in power and people in charge of distributing these accountable for what they're doing. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of that now. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about this, but, um, um, you know, there have been a lot of solutions that people have put forward in terms of maybe beginning to take steps to, um, you know, hold platforms accountable. None of them are perfect solutions. You know, they include all sorts of um, um, suggestions of sort of actually supporting and promoting human content moderators in addition to technical sort of content um, um, I guess detection systems um, and actually meaningfully supporting these human content moderators, hiring them in meaningful ways because they are sort of the only way that we can understand and begin to um, really I guess sort of catch some of these sort of social, historical, and cultural processes that are going on in the ways in which, um, you know, different types of content would be interpreted by different audiences to um, mean different things, to uh, interpolate different types of action based on, uh, you know, this fake uh, disinformation, misinformation, you know, things like that. Um, other people have said, you know, maybe we need to develop or sort of, we have a lot of laws that could hold a lot of these platforms accountable for disseminating this information or these types of um, videos, but they're not narrowly tailored enough. They're not enforced. Um, that's one avenue to pursue as well as, you know, actually encouraging platform companies to decide on what their values are and to enforce, you know, content in that way. And, you know, taken all together, these solutions show a very long road ahead. It's very hard to combat power, um, but it's something that I think that we have to do, and it shows that it is possible. We just need to sort of all work together and do it. So I think broad coalitions in this area are one thing that um, the media could work to, you know, foster. So, So yeah, actually, the point you mentioned about um, 
you know, this idea of uh, verifying providence and figuring out where something has actually come from. Um, you know, I've heard that sort of, you know, uh, even outside of deep fakes, but when we think about videos, whether it's from, you know, Myanmar or Syria to say, well, you know, we want to use this video, this image in a, you know, inter case at the International Criminal Court, um, but we can't be 100% certain it is what it says it is. It was taken where it was taken. Um, obviously, you know, the high-end cameras or most actual cameras will have uh, a lot of metadata attached to the picture, but we know that that normally gets ripped out when you post it onto any of the major social media platforms. I hear a lot of pitches from folks of saying just this, you know, we're building a system where that will support... Uh, providence um and basically saying you know we're going to watermark every piece of content to me that seems like such a you know mountain uh, because you would have to obviously embed it in every piece of hardware get every technology platform to buy into it um and then what about when you start editing editing videos and images you know it, it, but do you think that's I mean, it's technically possible, but do you think there's the will there and that that could ever happen? Yeah, so there's, so there's a few ways you can figure out provenance. So one would be, I suppose, like a, like a lo-fi way of doing like this watermark. And I agree, it'd be kind of this insurmountable task and what to stop someone from faking the watermark and you know, how, then you have to verify the verification and turtles all the way down, right? Um, the next one would be finding a way to algorithmically determine if pixels have been altered in an image. And that's, I think, where some of this is headed, is like determining provenance based on having some sort of a thing or like another algorithm to verify if somehow it's been doctored. Um, so that, that might be a second. The third one that actually I, um, I've been toying with or that, that I think is worth discussing is what if the, um, these open source algorithms, the parties that make them and put them out there, purposely make some sort of like backdoor way of verification, some way that it would fall apart, right? Some way that you could interrogate it. Because these algorithms don't fall from the sky. They're not made by God, right? They're made by companies. Somebody put these algorithms out there. They are open source. So is there responsibility of the organization or the company that makes them to provide some sort of a way that you can verify? And that's, I think that's a question worth asking. Yeah. Sorry, just yeah. before I pass this down, just on that point, the you know when, when you say to build an algorithm on on the pixel um, manipulation, I mean I there's you know it, it that gets back into the arms race thing, right? And I'm sure there's people in this room that the second you build an algorithm, somebody here will be able to build a better one to fuck with it. Um, so how do you address that? Yeah, and actually, you're pointing out one of the issues with like adversarial networks is in doing so, you've created the adversary that is just as good as the thing you've made, right? So you you actually do you end up pretty much creating it yourself because um, that's just how adversarial networks work. Um, there is, I mean, I suppose this is a hacker community like that. That has been the classic hacker problem, right? Like, right. It, it's a classic security problem. How do you create something that like you only have to be wrong once? Right, the other, like people on the other side um, just have to find one flaw. So it is a very it, I I don't think there's a good answer to that. Uh, like your thoughts. You, uh, you oh, well, you covered what I had to say yeah. mostly. <laughs> I, it's very much a cat and mouse game, and I don't think there's a good way to win. I think you just have to keep playing the game. The only way to win is to not play. But unfortunately, we can't do that anymore. I think the cat's out of the bag for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I also get a ton of pitches every day about the new greatest way to catch a deep fake. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, like everyone has said so far, it's, it's a, it's a fine goal. <laughs> um, I don't want to say stop doing that, stop making those things because it is, um, it's important, but, um, I don't know if that's the answer. Um, I don't know if watermarking, it's like we've already discussed, like, um, bias already exists. If you want to believe it or not, a watermark is not going to make you think that it's not real or, is real. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And I think also something to pay attention to, and I know Ramon sort of touched upon this with a couple of our comments, is that as much as we need to keep an eye on deep fakes, we need to keep an eye on the solutions and who is making these solutions, how power is being consolidated, economic power, social power, political power, discursive power. Whenever we're talking about, you know, 
these different types of solution that either focus on verification of pixels or of people doing, uh, you know, uploading videos or, um, you know, forensic detection of uh, other things. Um, and I think going back to the news coverage around this, it sort of fomented this panic um, that is very urgent uh, and, you know, palpable in a lot of ways that Ramon has talked about and that Sam wrote about. Um, but I think the message then gets translated into we need a quick fix. We absolutely need like a quick technological fix and a lot of the social and political problems that are absolutely necessary, the structural inequalities that are sort of implicated and grow from these technologies are not being attended to in meaningful ways. And I really like um, what Ruman was talking about earlier when she was saying the group that you're working with is, I can't remember them. But yeah, the partnership uh, was working on uh, working with v various communities, various sort of frontline communities, to begin to consider how you know we might build more just technologies. And I think that's something that we really need to highlight going forward. That a lot of the, you know technologists and public interest technologists, if we want to think about it that way, they don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel, but they need to highlight the work of people. Um, researchers and also communities, these uh, frontline communities that are already grappling with these issues, already have sets of solutions and already can clearly identify what the problems are uh, to promote better solutions. And so, so yeah, I think that's good enough for me. Yeah, yeah, just to add to that real quick, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's, I'm glad you said that because, um, yeah, I feel like a lot of these solutions um, are of a point of privilege, like if you, Maybe maybe I don't have access to like the ways to verify that these people are pitching me. Um, I got one recently that was like, "We'll make a camera that we'll put it in iPhones, and it'll only take like true images, and it'll be watermarked that way." If you're if you pitch me that and you're in this audience, please come talk to me. Um, yeah, <laughs> no offense, um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's that's tricky because like, what if I can't afford the the special iPhone that's just for journalists or like that's a lot of the people that are being targeted by this stuff can't. Um, can't reach these uh, fixes. Um, so, yeah, that's just my. I think the other part of it, I think Britt touched on this, is who holds the responsibility. And, like, there's really great work by this another researcher, Data Society, Mad Madeline Ailish, and she talks about how, um, you know, we're, we're the liability sponge. Right, so like we have these powers that be that create these things that are bad for society, and then the negative externality actually gets borne by society as a whole. And we actually need to question that. I think this is what Britt's getting at. Like that, that's the paradigm we fundamentally need to question: is the responsibility of taking care of deepfakes on all of us because a few powers that be decided to open source an algorithm that can make these things. And that's the part where we have to ask: is that really fair? Is the responsibility? And and again, it is not evenly born by society, as Britt's been saying. It is disproportionately born um, by women, by people of color, by low-income folks, and especially when you cross the three, you know, like, these are the people who are at the most. These are also the people who have the lowest access to resources. So even the liability sponge varies a lot by your demographics and your ability to even address or even understand the problem. So that's also a fundamental question we have to ask ourselves. Sure. So where does the responsibility lie then in, in tackling the, you know, <laughs> Because um, if, if it's um, sorry, but yeah, that's fine. <laughs> as I rant, um, the um, you know, as you mentioned, the, the victims of this it, this is inherently, as you say, sexist and inherently um, elitist uh, technology, at least the solutions in, in some respect. So, I mean, obviously, the, the victims, as you mentioned, do not have the resources to uh, try tackle the problem. So, who is responsible for? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it, yeah. it goes back to the elites, though, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is a, a common theme that's come up in a lot of the talks I've seen in Ethics Village and AI Village is who holds the responsibility and who is accountable. And, like, for those of us who work in the ethics space, this is the number one thing we're all tackling. So I'm, like, weaseling around your answer, by the way, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, no, because seriously, it is not a solved problem. It's just, like, a hot potato issue, and we all kind of agree that there's a giant turd and it's, like, smelly. But who's going to pick it? Like, seriously, but who's going who's gonna to pick it up? <laughs> Um, and we're all kind of like like darting around each other to say, well, like, you know, people should be responsible for consuming media that's good for them. I mean, we had social media companies say for years, years, oh, we, we're, we're just an intermediary. We're not, we're, not, we're not media companies. We're not responsible. 
the companies that would make these open source algorithms would say, well, we can't be responsible for how people use it. It's like the ultimate, um, like, you know, sort of distributed harm. And, when, and even in notions of like privacy, security, whenever you have distributed harm, it is very, very difficult to determine accountability and culpability. I feel like Britt has thoughts. Go ahead. Plus one on all can, can I like can I like shout out your really great medium article about responsible rollout like you yeah because like if I, don't, I I would like to ask you to talk about that please <laughs> so it's a medium article published in data and society points uh, and it was covering open AI's um, f uh, yeah, GPT-2, the text, the sort of text misinformation, artificial intelligence-driven text disinformation disseminator, so to speak. Um, and their sort of botched rollout of, um, of this tool uh, and the ways in which they sort of were secretive about it, but really wanted to sort of get it out in the public and talk about like how very powerful it would be, but oh no, 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 we could not possibly put it in the public. You know, we could not possibly, you know, develop a real sort of strategy, security strategy around uh, putting this um, new GPT-2, this uh, fake text disseminator into the public, but they really wanted to talk about how good it was. Um, so, um, in the end, you know, this issue of panic around artificial intelligence driven technology is something that I don't think I need to explain. We see it every day in the news, or, you know, in the news. Um, but this panic creates openings for technical solutions or it creates openings for people to slide in, like I was saying earlier, with these very quick technical fixes that stand to gain a lot of economic profit. Um, from from developing these solutions and putting them out in the public. Um, and the, we're sort of hoodwinked in some ways by believing, you know, we must avoid these, uh, I mean, and we must, right? Like these negative externalities are admittedly bad, uh, but we don't want the solution to be worse uh, than the problem itself. So that was what I wrote about in the Medium article. I don't know if there's anything else specifically uh, off the top of my head. Uh, that's yeah, useful. I'd like to share what I liked about it. Oh, from well. a technologist's perspective. <laughs> well, like, which is very interesting because I, I, from a technologist's perspective, what I thought was really interesting that you pointed out in it was, you know, we do have precedence in other, uh, like in, a, in sciences, et cetera, for like if somebody creates something that could potentially be dangerous, how do we roll it out, right? How, like who do we give it to? And the difference between, let's say, like biomedical sciences versus AI or the fields that we're in is we don't really have an accountability structure. We don't have like a like an FDA or something like that for like a verification or a third party that we fundamentally believe and trust. And if anything, in these communities, sometimes it is the most powerful organizations that are the ones we don't trust. So when you're talking about like, a, let's say, like you know, some small startup doesn't have to be open AI, it could be anybody, creates this algorithm, they realize it could be a multi-use like it can a multi-purpose product, it can do harm. What are the steps to take? And like to your point about accountability, like these are the things people are trying to understand and address. So, what does responsible rollout look like? Does it mean you know we roll it out to the government first, or you know some like trusted um, company or organization that we know will use it responsibly, just to have people sort of pressure test it? Um, you know, and I was actually talking to Jack Clark, um, who's a policy lead for OpenAI, and and you know, and, and I, I know it's something there. Like we're all sort of trying to figure this out together. So kind of to get back to your question, there is no good answer. Um, and to Britt's point, there are no quick fixes. And if anything is a quick fix, then it's probably a lie. Or it'll probably have a negative externality that we have not even thought of yet. I actually had a tweet about like something else the other day. And pretty much I said, like, TLDR, if a founder tells you they're trying to save the world, like, don't trust them. <laughs> like, like, their product will not save the world. Nobody can save the world with a product. So, um, Yeah, I mean, I think it's the... the what I've seen a lot of from from pitches that I get from, particularly people in the ac academic community um, and nonprofit world who are working in this, is they are so. Uh, I think there's a pressure there, right, to show your work to get future funding. So there's sort of a demand to that you have to put this out in the wild to sort of remind people you're doing something. Um, it, I'm going to open. Uh, 
it up to a question shortly, but just on the on the point of um, you know putting this stuff out there in the wild, um, Sam, you've obviously done a lot of reporting on deep fakes, the the original Reddit user, um, but I wanted to get you know just a sense from you of you know what's your gut on who do you think they are and maybe what maybe you haven't been able to write in an article because you you know don't have proof but um who they are and what their motivations are do you think we're gonna dox deepfakes on this panel right now (laughs) here no um no i don't actually um i even if i did know i would not be able to say um yeah it's tough because um yeah (laughs) i would like we we exchanged a few dms um and then the first article came out and he did not like it um and i stopped talking to me so that's fine um but yeah like i said um i i know that he's a programmer of some kind obviously um i don't know if it's like at a research institution or like um just a guy in his basement like tinkering away I don't know um I can only go by what he told me and he might have been lying um it might be that he was working somewhere really important and big and didn't want to get in trouble with his employer or something like I can't really um say for sure who he is other than um he told me that he's just someone on the internet which is factually true (laughs) yeah do you want to open any questions so I wonder if we could talk about the kind of private sharing of deep fakes on platforms like WhatsApp through text where there is no public record. Yeah, this is, I mean. Repeat the question. So um, the question was, uh, or the sort of provocation was, you'd like us to talk about uh, the private sharing of deep fakes and fake videos on um, encrypted and secure platforms like WhatsApp and things that are more like less uh, publicly accessible. Yeah, okay. Um, So this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, This is something that I call hidden virality. Um, That the extent to which, you know, these platforms are created uh, because, you know, they are supposed to um, foster sort of communal values, Um, you know, you're supposed to know everybody that you share with, you can only share, you know, within a small group of people, and those people can share within smaller groups of people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And this is very useful and valuable in certain places where, um, you know, media structures are not to be trusted generally, and so, you know, sharing information among friends, among family members, among trusted parties uh, is the sort of assumption that these platforms were built with, right? Um, But what ends up happening is these are hacked by, hacked, I say, you know, this is basic social engineering, uh, by nefarious parties who want to spread disinformation within trusted parties. Um, And we, you know, people, and the platforms themselves don't find out about it until the problem is already so big that it's caused something terrible to happen. You know, we can look to um, India, we can look to Myanmar, you know, these types of things are uh, happening there. Um, And there is no way at present, I mean, I don't know how to fix it. I know a lot of people are working on it. I know some of my colleagues at Harvard uh, are working on this right now. Um, But I think... It is these very private sharing platforms um, that have a lot of, I guess, a lot of ability or uh, probability that uh, something dangerous will happen based on the, the disinformation that spreads there. Yeah, over there. Somebody else might want to talk about it. Um, it's good. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Helping to address that issue is having bounties for technologies as they're released for ethical issues. 
so the question was about um, whether or not there would be potential for making bug bounties to sort of interrogate technology. So there's sort of two parts to it. I think you're right, like with things like if PAI has the X prize on determining provenance of information, that's a place where you can use it. But there is the problem or the thing about algorithms and a lot of these things that they, they can be used for many different things. So there's no way to interrogate the ability to make a deep fake that would stop anybody from making pornographic pictures because that's just somebody's application of the ability to generate synthetic media. Um, so that's that's sort of one of the problems there. But but I do think you're absolutely correct. I think that is a really good way to start thinking about a lot of the malicious use and even unintended consequences, ethical issues. So I meant prior to the release of the So her follow-up was that um, it's more about evaluating before so you could identify the potential harms to determine whether or not it should be released. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I would be genuinely surprised if any of these corporations that made some of these algorithms didn't think about like, you know, oh, it could be used for this thing. Um, and, and this is not to blame these companies. It's to say we don't actually have a framework of going through these potential threats to understand what the impact might be. You know, and this is sort of the difficulty, I think, in the security space, the privacy space, and now in the ethics space. What we sell people is nothing, right? Like, if I do my job, like this when I go to clients, I, I will literally say, if I do my job, then nothing will happen. It's very hard to make that as a value proposition versus someone who's going to dangle this cool, new, fun, shiny toy. And like, oh, look, you can make like a video of the Mona Lisa singing. Ha, 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 isn't that cool? And then I'm coming in and saying, someone might make porn, so you shouldn't release this. Then they're like, oh, but I can't make my Mona Lisa video. It's like the, the, what you're, the core of what you're getting at here is, I think in the ethics community, we're going to have to figure out what it is we're offering people. Because when I think of my job, I think of incentives and actors. And I would love to think everyone's a nice, kind, generous human being, but they're not, right? So I may be talking to someone who frankly doesn't care if pornography is going to be made. It's not worth it to them as much as it would be worth the like, media media frenzy around releasing this new algorithm, et cetera. So it's balancing all those things. So it might be, I just don't know how effective it might be. So I don't know. Do you want to share something? I, I guess I have kind of a comment. Um, so when I think about how deep fakes are going to be used, um, like, yes, there's obviously, like, porn is going to be a big thing, but um, if we also look at uh, Photoshop, yes, people do make a lot of celebrity Photoshops, and yes, there are a lot of Reddit groups about this. Um, but there's also a lot of artistic potential for this kind of technology, and I kind of think it's going to be sort of a, a bifurcation in terms of, or I, I guess more of like a bimodal thing, where either we're going to have like extremely harmful uses of women getting victimized, or we're going to have like really cool uh, style transfer videos of like the Lion King and like some different um, animation style kind of thing. Um, and one of those is very cool. Um, one of them is maybe not as cool, obviously. Um, but we need to figure out how we're going to weight the, these two possibilities. Who are the threat actors that, like, I guess this also comes down to threat modeling. Like, what is the likelihood that this is going to happen? Um, there's probably more money, honestly, in making weird Lion King videos than there is in porn, <laughs> depending on how we do regulation for this. Um, so I think that the regulation piece is pretty important. Uh, yeah. I literally just like weird art shit. Yeah, it's like, it's like funny, yeah. yeah. Like there's like a lot of funny stuff. Like the the Mona Lisa singing thing is real, right? So there's a whole. It was actually very interesting. Like you could train um, on 32. I think it was like 33 frames, yeah. like 33 still images. The, and and you can generate a deep fake and what somebody did was all these different paintings look like they were singing or talking and it was, it was fascinating it was very very interesting um, yeah and there's like style transfer stuff where you can make you know Lion King like look like 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 noir style black and white with cool shadows and um, but in terms of like a for good application as in like seriously impacting society or people I don't you know, I mean, one can say humor, especially now that, like, everything's on fire. What about Snapchat filters? Oh, yeah, what about Snapchat yeah. filters? What about when, like, they forget to turn them off and they're, and, like, yeah. right? And, and they're holding, like, government <laughs> meetings and they leave the kitten filter on. I mean, that made my day. And like I said, the world's on fire right now, so, like, maybe that is AI for good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy 
network that people had traced through, and they're like, yeah, we found fake news, this is a solved problem, just get the browser extension, this will never happen again, and nobody ever used it. Uh, this, to me, it, it seems like your discussion is saying, this is a problem, but it's maybe not inherently a technical problem, mm -hmm. it's a problem that's mm -hmm. enabled by mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there something special about the X Prize that makes you think that a technical solution oh. will help? Uh, and just yeah. sort of comment a little bit more about the ethics space. So. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to put words in partnerships. It's not my, like, thing. I mean, the thing about the XPRIZE is there's going to be millions of dollars behind it. So, like, you know, somebody, it will be a massive incentive. Um, again, like, I cannot speak to the project. It is not mine. I've, you know, sort of been on one planning call about it. That, that's it. That's all I know. Um, but, you know, it is something they're exploring. And, and I think that, but, you know, back to the bug bounty thing, putting a lot of money behind it would certainly help. Having the name of, like, XPRIZE, Richard Branson, Partnership on AI, et cetera, would really help. It'll, whoever, you know, if that's, if that's where they go and if it's a sol something somebody solves, it'll earn them a lot of credit. But to your point, of, I, n I not even heard about that browser extension <laughs> thing, honestly. Um, but, but it's also, it's a collective action problem, right? Like, you would have to get all of the different media outlets literally around the world, as well as all the platforms together to agree, and I don't even know how you would solve that, to your point about it being a human issue. To me, that sounds like a massive collective action problem, not a technology problem. My dad's yeah, also. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, that, you know, I think a lot of this gets back to just human nature, right? Um, and even with Facebook's fact-checking initiative, um, you know, a lot of people just don't trust the fact-checkers. Um, and also, I thought it was quite telling in that after the New Zealand um, shooting and, you know, a lot of people were giving um, lawmakers, everybody's giving Facebook a tough time for that video circulating. Uh, but then Facebook released the numbers of how many people, or at least how many users, tried to re-upload that video. And there was, uh, you know, a few million instances of that. So, um, yeah, I, it does, I have, and I'm, Ariel can speak much better to this, but, um, or sorry, Brit can speak much better to this. Um, and Ariel can as well, I'm sure. Um, the uh, that that you know how much uh, as we focus on this technical and platform problem, how much is just a human problem? Right. I mean, I feel like I'm being a broken record here a little bit, but you know, the fact that um, audiovisual evidence we assume that it has ever spoken for itself. Um, I think is something that we need to interrogate. Um, you know, it requires sort of social work to determine what is and what isn't evidence. It requires social processes of determining what is truth. The reason that we'd agree on what truth is is because it is a social process uh, of, you know, determining who the experts will be and determining, you know, what is the frame in which uh, their expertise will be disseminated. And people who have economic, social, and discursive power have a very vested interest in determining who the experts are and what they say. Um, so that is to say, it's a complex problem um, and it's a complex problem that people in political science in sociology um, in library and information science have been working on you know for for hundreds of years and don't have <laughs> a, a clear answer on you know what is the best solution here but I think those communities are places to start to talk to people um, in determining how we might fix this problem I know Ramon's very um, active in the AI ethics space, and I know that a lot of people within the AI ethics space are. Mark Lantanero is here in the audience, or he was. Um, he's someone else who uh, I think could speak to this. Um, but yeah, that is to say it is complex, um, and you know, truth is difficult. <laughs> Right. So the question is, are there underground, is there an underground movement 
of sorts. Um, not like a movement, but like a, an underground group of actors who are taking these really shitty academic tools and trying to use them for bad. And the answer is complicated because it's both yes and no. Um, because, so outside of like the machine learning bubble, it's actually quite hard to penetrate the machine learning bubble. So if you don't already have these skills, um, you're not likely to really pick them up because you, you can go through like the Andrew Ng MOOC course about machine learning and you get like three lessons in and you're like, why the hell am I doing this? This isn't helping me make deep fakes. And then you quit and then you find something else to do. Um, but that said, like there are still skilled actors out there, like maybe bored grad students, um, who do kind of network and do this stuff because they're bored. But it's uh, the, the number of people who do that is very small, um, and it's not it's not something that I would consider a threat, honestly, um, at least at this point. Because I mean, like you said, the, the tools are extremely shitty, and until we have better UI, we usually find that people don't really adopt tools very much. Hey, Deb. <laughs> Deb's question was about um, what does legislation look like in this space? That's an excellent question. So there's a few, um, there are a few bills out there. There is um, uh, like a, a deep fakes bill out there. There are things like the Detour Act and things about, you know, trying to stop. But they're, so they're, they're very focused on the harms. Um, and I think and what you're actually touching on here is the fact that there's this level of knowledge and understanding about this technology that just doesn't quite exist in the legislative space yet. And one of the biggest challenges has been like educating lawmakers. Like, I love how you started this panel by asking what's hype and what's, what's not. Um, whenever I go to DC, you know, that is the number one question that lawmakers will ask. Like, should I be worried about deep fake? Should I worry about bots? Should I worry about killer drones? Should I go? There seems to be like everything. Um, so I, I think it's just so two parts to my answer. Number one, legislation is going to be a very long and difficult process. Um, but number two, I think the way we've seen the most success is figuring out how existing law applies to these situations and looking at it from a harms perspective. Um, there's a lot of really great work actually that comes out of the privacy space because that, that's the space the ethics community is learning from. We're learning from the privacy and security space, to be honest. Um, so what are the existing laws on the books that not, it doesn't have to be a regulating a technology. It's about the potential harms of the technology. So, you know, New York City and then the New York State passing revenge porn law wasn't necessarily, it could have been just about like videos and nudes that were real, but it can apply to a deep fake. So thinking about legislation that way might actually be more valuable, especially given we're going into an election year and divided government, et cetera. That might actually be a more valuable way of thinking about things. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't allow anyone a second question, but this guy's almost jumping out of his seat here. So. <laughs> OJ Simpson question. Yeah. Yeah. Like anyone who's old enough to remember, there's like the OJ Simpson DNA evidence. It's the same question. It is literally the question about DNA evidence, right? Sorry. And the Rodney King, and the Rodney King video. Well, the Rod yes, the Rodney. Yeah. I think you have. Oh. Thoughts. Oh well. Okay. Oh sorry. <laughs> Do you want to just repeat the question? So the question was, if there was a murder case and the defense for the murder. So, alleged murder, uh, said that the video was a deep fake of the person. Um, would that hold up in court? Oh, how, would, how would you rule it? Like, how would you rule it? Would you, do, would you just instantly discredit it, or how would you look into it? And how would you look into it? How would you uh, adjudicate it, yeah. so to speak? Um, so I've actually learned a lot about how this works in the courts. And if Danielle Citrone was on this panel today, she would say um, that this is a classic example of the liar's dividend in which someone can claim that a video of them doing something wrong would be you know, used by someone to uh, excuse themselves from culpability of this act. And this is a huge problem. Um, however, the courts do have pretty strict forensic capacities um, whenever they're looking at videos. Um, and I know this because I have a lot of friends who practice law. Um, and 
you know, I think that a deep fake at present would be able to, you know, we would be able to understand there would be strict, you know, there would be a lot of scrutiny on this video to determine whether or not it was a deep fake. Um, but, you know, I have um, an example that I often use, you know, say somebody's in a child custody case and they're bringing, you know, character witnesses to the stand and somebody makes, you know, it doesn't even have to be a deep fake. It can be just like a fake like a video of someone that they say is, you know, this person who's uh, witnessed they're supposed to be, or who's, who they're supposed to be witnessing the character of um, is doing something, you know, inappropriate. And this was sent to their character witnesses. Would this hold up in court? You know, it's not introduced into the court as evidence, but it is sort of distributed to people that would talk about uh, this person's character and it could, you know, uh, have an effect on what they would say. So. That's the sort of issue that I would see. But go ahead. No, do one more question. Uh, yeah. So uh, Photoshop has been around for a long time now, and uh, I think people are now suspicious of uh, static images. So is it going to be any different with deep fakes? Like, given more time, will people become really suspicious of videos? I don't think so. I think it, we're going to have. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so your question was, do you think that, um, so people are already pretty suspicious about static images, but do we think that people are going to become similarly suspicious of um, video? Um, and I think that people are already kind of suspicious of video because uh, Adobe After Effects has been around for a while. Um, you can doctor videos. Uh, I think um, we're still kind of too early in the tech cycle for a lot of these deep fakes to be really um, convincing. One of, one of my favorite deep fakes is one of uh, somebody took Elon Musk's face and they put it on a bunch of babies. And so there's just like these kind of weird looking <laughs> Elon AI Musk AI babies things. <laughs> that is AI for that good. Is, <laughs> yeah. Right. And, but like the, the, the face mapping doesn't quite work quite well because the babies, okay. I guess, are too wiggly and Elon Musk is just too <laughs> meh. Um, so, so like you can tell that it's a deep fake. So I, I don't think we're quite there for it to be suspicious. Um, I do think we, we will get there at some point, but it, it's hard for me to put a number on like one that might be. Actually, just as you mentioned Adobe, um, and then also your point on sort of corporate responsibility and putting this stuff out in the wild, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers, but it was, just, it, was at a, it was just a few days, I think, before the 2016 election where Adobe demonstrated this new uh, audio uh, software. What was it called? Voco, and basically where you take a few minutes of somebody's voice and then you could type them to make them say anything. I've been asking Adobe, uh, they haven't released that yet, um, and my, I've wondered if they sort of saw what exploded after the election and how, you know, uh, disinformation came into the public discourse in a way and said, ooh, maybe we shouldn't put this out. Uh, but they won't answer my question, so that's <laughs> not very helpful. Um, but thank you so much to all our panelists and thank you all for your great questions. Thank you.